Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law. For today's case, we're going back to do some of the origins as it relates to qualified immunity, a topic that has come up quite often on this channel. So we're going back to one of the foundational cases in this issue. This is the case of Harlow versus Fitzgerald. This is US Supreme Court in 1981, which lays out some of the stuff as it relates to both absolute immunity and qualified immunity. So we're going to read this case. We'll skip around a little bit because it's you know relatively lengthy, but we're going to cover the major stuff so we understand the doctrine of qualified immunity and some of the places it came from. So let's get started with this. The issue in this case is the scope of immunity available to senior aides and advisors of the President of the United States in a suit for damages for things based on their official acts. In this suit for civil damages, Harlow and Butterfield are alleged to have participated in a conspiracy to violate the rights of Fitzgerald. The respondent offers petitioners entered into the conspiracy in their capacities as aides to President Nixon. As the alleged conspiracy is the same that involved Nixon versus Fitzgerald, the facts need not be repeated in detail. The respondent claims that Harlow joined the conspiracy in his role as a presidential aide responsible for congressional relations. At the conclusion of discovery and supporting evidence remained inferential. As evidence of Harlow's conspiratorial activity, respondent relies heavily on a series of conversations in which Harlow discusses Fitzgerald's dismissal with the Air Force Secretary. The other evidence that is most supportive of the claims consists of a recorded conversation in which President Lairs voiced attentive recollection that Harlow was all for Kenning Fitzgerald. So basically, we have very limited evidence that apparently shows why some action was being taken against someone, but maybe enough for trial? Okay. Disputing the contentions, Harlow argues the exhaustive discovery has deduced no direct evidence of his involvement in any wrongful activity. He offers the secretary advised him that considerations of efficiency require removal by the reduction in force, despite an anticipated adverse congressional reaction. So he's offering that they're doing it for what we might call a legitimate business purpose. You know, we're doing a reduction in force. So we're doing it for reasons that are unrelated to this. So we're going to terminate this guy, not because of anything he did, but just because, you know, we don't need his position anymore. And they're saying, well, this is going to cause some problems with Congress. You know, they're not going to look on this reasonably, but this is what we're doing. It's a neutral reason. That's what they're saying. Harlow asserts that he had no reason to believe a conspiracy act existed. He contends that he took the actions he took in good faith. So he's saying there wasn't like a conspiracy to come after you. We're just doing it because of business need, essentially. The petitioner Butterfield is also have alleged to entered into this conspiracy in May 1969. Employed as the deputy assistant to the president and chief of staff, Butterfield circulated a White House memorandum in that month, which he claimed to have learned that Fitzgerald planned to blow the whistle on some shoddy purchase practicing by exposing these practices to public view. So this looks like it might be retaliation, not that's any way relevant to any issues occurring in the current day, right? Fitzgerald characterizes this memorandum as evidence that Butterfield has commenced efforts to secure a retaliatory dismissal. We're doing it for reasons of retaliation, not because of some business need. In evidence that Butterfield participated in the conspiracy to conceal his unlawful discharge to prevent reemployment, Fitzgerald cites communications between Butterfield and Halderman in 1969 and 1970. After the president promised at a press conference to inquire into this dismissal, Halderman solicited Butterfield's recommendation. A subsequent memorandum emphasized the importance of loyalty. Butterfield counseled against offering Fitzgerald another time, another in that point in time. So, like, there's a, a whole bunch of, bunch of potential reasons we might be trying to dismiss the guy, some of which may be legitimate and some of which may not be legitimate. As I understand, President Trump has recently dismissed the inspector general, who was the one who forwarded the report that was the major basis for impeach, impeachment. So it might be parallel to that issue in some respects. But let's go back to what happened in the 60s and 70s, right? So we're, we're terminating this person, maybe because we're doing just a reduction of force. Maybe because they're just generally unloyal, or maybe it's because of retaliation. So there's a couple different reasons that we might be doing this. Some might be legitimate, some might not be legitimate. So we might want to get to the reasons why behind this. Okay, let's go to that. For his part, Butterfield denies that he was involved in any decision concerning Fitzgerald's employment status until Howerman sought his advice in 1969, more than a month after the termination had been scheduled. Butterfield states that he never communicated his views about Fitzgerald to any official to the Defense Department. He argues generally that nearly eight years of discovery had failed to turn up any evidence of harm. 
So he's saying, like, there's been a whole bunch of eight years of discovery is a lot, incidentally. Wow. But he's arguing that there's been no evidence that shows that, like, there was anything improper. Causality. Okay. Together with the co-defendant, Richard Nixon, Petitioner Howell and Butterfield moved for summary judgment. In denying the motion, they upheld legal sufficiency of Fitzgerald's Bivens case under the First Amendment and a first statutory cause of action. Okay, so, so Bivens is a case that stands for the proposition that it's it's sort of the federal equivalent to 1983 is the easiest way to think about it. So 1983, 42 USC 1983, is a cause of action that allows you to go after state level employees for violation of federal rights. Okay, so there's no federal statute that essentially says the same thing, but there's a case that does called Bivens versus Six Unknown Agents. So it's sort of the equivalent of 1983 for federal agents. That being said, over the years, I think Bivens has been used successfully like three times. So it's not anywhere near the category that 1983 does in terms of its success rate, right? But they were saying, okay, this is a Bivens cause of action and, you know, for, for problems that you have violated a fundamental right and so we get to invent a cause of action. So that was one of the things that was being said. So that's Bivens. The court found genuine issues of disputed facts that remained for resolution trial. It also ruled petitioners were not entitled to absolute immunity. Absolute immunity is relatively rare. It's normally available for prosecutors and judges for their official acts. But yeah, saying that these aren't entitled to absolute immunity, fair enough. Independently of President Nixon, petitioners invoked collateral order doctrine and appealed the denial of the immunity defense to the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. The Court of Appeals dismissed without an opinion. So they just, you know, they went to appeal and the district court said no and didn't even bother to say why. Never having determined the immunity available to senior aides, we grant cert. All right. So the question is, at the moment, what is the level of immunity, if any, available to senior aides of the president? Is there any sort of immunity for their official acts done in the name of their service? So, yes, we'll see what's going on. As we reiterated today in Nixon versus Fitzgerald, our decisions consistently have held government officials are entitled to some form of immunity for sort of damages. As recognized in common law, public officers require protection to shield them from undue interference with their duties and potentially disabling threats of liability. Our decisions have recognized immunity defenses of two kinds. For officials whose special functions or constitutional status requires complete protection, we've recognized absolute immunity. The absolute immunity of legislatures in their legislative functions and of judges in their judicial functions is now well settled. So, so you know, among other things, you can't sue judges for their judicial decisions. And you can't sue legislatures for legislative decisions. You know, that, that isn't going to fly. Um you know, whether or not what things should be folded into legislative decisions, you know, a la Elizabeth Warren and defamation and whether or not that qualifies as speaking on the floor, it's a whole other set of issues, right? But there is a general idea that for official acts, you know, you can't, as much as wishing might make it so, you can't sue a legislature for taking a particular vote, you know, so, you know, fair enough. Our decisions have also extended absolute immunity to certain officials of executive. These include prosecutors and other officials, executive officers engaged in administrative or adjudicative functions, and the President of the United States. The absolute immunity is, of course, limited to official acts. Official acts. So, the degree to which Trump or anyone else can be held immune, and again, also does not apply to impeachment. This is criminal, you know, or civil, not impeachment. That's a different category. For executive officials in general, however, our cases make plain that qualified immunity respects the norm. In a prior case, we acknowledge that high officials require great protection than those of less complex discretionary responsibilities. One might wonder the degree to which a police officer qualifies as a high official, but let's press on. Nonetheless, we held a governor and his aides could receive the requisite protection for qualified or good faith immunity. In Butts, we extend the approach of whatever to high federal officials of the executive branch. Discussing in detail the considerations that also underlay our decisions, we explain that recognition of qualified immunity defense for high executives reflects an attempt to balance competing values, not only the importance of damages remedy to the rights of citizens, but also the need to protect officials who are required to exercise discretion or related public interest, encouraging the vigorous exercise of official authority. You know, once again, this is one of the reasons why I'm not necessarily keen to abolish the entire doctrine of qualified immunity. Like, I think I think there's a rationale here that makes sense. You know, whether or not we can constrain it to the rationale that makes sense is a whole other set of problems. 
So like my first move, if it were up to me, would be trying to look for ways to sufficiently constrain qualified immunity rather than abolish qualified immunity. You know, I don't begrudge anyone who says we should abolish qualified immunity because of all the negative things that happen. But I'm, I'm thinking about the reasons it was invented in the first place. And those reasons are probably valid. So it would be nice. It would be nice to find a way to have both the good and the bad at the same time. Right. It would be nice to like fix the problem without like doing more than we're trying to do. So all that's being considered, I like to try to find ways to constrain qualified immunity rather than eliminate it if it can be done. So, you know, there is a rationale here somewhere. Without discounting the adverse consequences of de denying high officials absolute immunity, consequences found sufficient in different cases to warrant execution to such officials of absolute immunity, we emphasize our expectation that insubstantial suits need not proceed to trial. Okay, fair enough. Insubstantial lawsuits can be quickly terminated by federal courts alert to the possibility of artful pleading. Unless a complaint states a compensatable claim for relief, it should not survive a motion to dismiss, which is just generally true, period. I'm not sure what that has to do with qualified immunity, but okay. Moreover, the court recognized in our case that damage to its concerning constitutional violations need not proceed to trial, but can be terminated on properly supported motion for summary judgment based on defense of immunity. In responding to such a motion, plaintiff may not play dog in manage manger. In responding to such a motion, plaintiffs may not play dog in the manger. What does that mean? I don't know. And firm application of the federal rules of civil procedure will ensure federal officials are not harassed by frivolous lawsuits. Yeah, that that is a fair point. That you know, we we do want our executive officials to being able to do some things without fear of the frivolous, because God knows that happens too, right? Shoot. Yeah. The prior case called Butts continues to acknowledge that special functions of some officials may require absolute immunity. But the court held that federal officials who seek absolute exemption from unconstitutional conduct must bear the burden of showing that public policy requires exemption of that scope. This we reaffirm today in the case of Nixon, presumably dealing with the president and his absolute immunity for official acts, which does not extend to impeachment once again. Petitioners argue they're entitled to blanket protection of absolute immunity as an incident to their offices as aides. In deciding this claim, we do not write on the empty page. In the prior case of Butts, the Secretary of Agriculture, a cabinet official directly accountable to the president, asserted defense of absolute immunity for, suit for civil damages. We rejected the claim. In doing so, we do not question the importance or power of the secretary, nor do we now deny the importance of the president of loyal and efficient subordinates in executing duties. Yet we found these factors alone to be insufficient to grant absolute immunity. The greater power of high officials, we reason, affords a greater potential for a regime of lawless conduct. Okay. I'm I not, I not quite sold on that reasoning, but all right. Defendants' actions against high officials were therefore important means of evicting constitutional guarantees. Moreover, we concluded that it would be untenable to draw a distinction for purposes of immunity law between suits against state officials and suits brought directly against the Constitution against federal officials under Bivens. Okay, so they're basically saying that federal law and state law should be treated the same which would be nice if Bivens was treated the same as 1983, which is not anywhere close to treated the same. Bivens is a much more constrained, much more constrained cause of action. It's been used two, three, four times in like the last 50 years successfully. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not really a thing. So like if it were just being held to parallel, then that'd be fine, but not so much. No, not in reality. Having decided in butts that members of the cabinet ordinarily enjoy only qualified immunity, we conclude it would be equally untenable to hold absolute immunity to the incident of office of every presidential subordinate. Can't disagree with that, right? If a cabinet member doesn't qualify, why should a random aide? Members of the cabinet are direct subordinates, frequent with greater responsibility. Yep, these considerations of support our decision apply with equal force here. It's no disparagement of the offices held by petitioners to hold that presidential aides, like members of the cabinet, are generally only qualified immunity. That makes sense to me. In disputing the controlling authority of the case called Butts, petitioners rely on principles developed in Gravel. In Gravel, we endorse the view that it's literally impossible for members of Congress to perform their legislative tasks without the help of aides as assistants, and day-to-day -day work of such aides is so critical that it must be treated as their alter egos, as though it were them. Okay. Having done so, we held the speech and debate clause derivatively applicable to legislative acts of Senators A that would have been privileged if performed by Senator themselves. Okay, fair enough. Petitioners contend the rationale of gravel 
mandates a similar derivative immunity for the chief aides of the president of the United States, which is a reasonable point, right? If the aides of Congress people get absolute immunity for derivative acts as agents, then the aides should get derivative acts if the president is absolutely immune. I mean, that's a reasonable argument by parallel. I can't disagree. Emphasizing the president must delegate a large measure of authority to executive duties of his office. They argue that recognition of derivative absolute immunity is essential by all the considerations that support absolute immunity of the president himself. I mean, by reasoning by parallel, that's a pretty good argument. I cannot disagree with that argument by reasoning by parallel. So let's see what the court says. Petitioner's argument is not without force. Ultimately, however, it sweeps too far. The president's aides are derivatively immune because they're essential to the functions of the presidency and members of the cabinet, subordinates, whose essential role are acknowledged, should be absolutely immune, which does seem to hold fair. Yet we implicitly reject such derivative immunity in that case called Butts, which might suggest that Butts is wrong because it's a reasonable argument. Moreover, in general, our cases have followed a functional approach to immunity law. We have recognized that judicial, prosecutorial, and legislative functions require absolute immunity. But its protection extend no further than would justify would warrant. For gravel, for example, we emphasize the senator and their aides were absolutely immune only when performing acts legislative in nature, not when taking other acts even in their official capacity. Okay, fair enough. Our cases involving judges and prosecutors have involved similar lines. The undifferentiated extension of absolute derivative immunity to the aides could therefore not be reconciled with this functional approach including with gravel itself. I find that a little bit unsatisfying. You know, I find that a little bit unsatisfying. I feel like the, the parallelism is pretty strong. And like, if you want to constrain the application of it in some way, you constrain it to the legislature. I think that's fine. But like, I don't think, it, I don't think one quite follows the other now. The petitioners also assert entitlement to immunity based on special functions. This form of argument accords with the analytical approach of our cases. For aides entrusted with discretionary authority in such sensitive areas as national security or foreign policy, absolute immunity might be well justified to protect the un unhesitating performance of functions vital to the national interest. But special functions rationale does not warrant a blanket recognition of absolute immunity. So the Secretary of Defense might still have a clause there. So, yeah. This conclusion, too, falls from our decision in Butts, which established that executive official claimed absolute immunity must be justified by reference to public interest in special functions, not the mere fact of the high station. So like some secretarial offices might be better than others. So the, the attorney general may be, the secretary of defense may be, but secretary of agriculture, not so much. So like, yeah, some cabinet officers are better than others, I guess. Butts also identifies the location of the burden of proof. The burden of justifying absolute immunity rests on the officials asserting the claim. We have no course had occasion to identify how a presidential aid might carry this. But general requisites are familiar. In order to establish an absolute immunity, presidential aid must first show responsibilities of the office embrace a function so sensitive as require a total shield. He must demonstrate that he is discharging the protective function when performing the act. Applying these standards, we cannot conclude absolute immunity. Okay. Even if they cannot establish absolute immunity, they assert qualified immunity, with which we agree. So we're going to get into the qualified immunity issue. The resolution of qualified... The resolution of immunity questions inherently requires a balance between the evils inevitable and any available alternative. In situations of abuse of office, an action for damages may be the only risk realistic action for vindication. At the same time, however, it cannot be disputed seriously that claims frequently run against the innocent as well as the guilty, at a cost not only to defendant officials but society as a whole. These social costs include the expense of litigation, the diversion of energy from pressing issues, and the deterrence of citizens from accepting public office. Finally, there is a danger that fear of being sued will dampen the ardor of all but the most resolute. In identifying qualified immunity as the best attainable accommodation, we relied on the assumption the standard would permit insubstantial lawsuits to be quickly terminated. How many of the lawsuits we've covered on our channel are insubstantial in nature is an interesting question. A lot of them where they were dismissed, I wouldn't necessarily qualify as insubstantial. A lot of them are quite disturbing to my mind. Petitioners advance persuasive arguments dismissal of insubstantial lawsuits without trial, a factor presupposed in the balancing of competing interests struck by our prior cases, requires an adjustment of the good faith standard required by our decisions. Well, that's not necessarily the something I disagree with, although I might be adjusting it the other way, but fair enough. Qualified or good faith immunity is an affirmative defense that must be pleaded. Decisions of this court have established good faith to be both objective and subjective, 
The objective element involves presumptive knowledge of and respect for basic unquestioned constitutional rights. The subjective refers to permissible intentions. Characteristically, the court has defined these elements by identifying the circumstances in which qualified immunity would not be available. Referring both to objective and subjective, we have held qualified immunity would be defeated an official knew or reasonably should have known the action he took within the sphere of official responsibility would violate constitutional rights of the plaintiff or if he took the action with malicious intention to cause deprivation of constitutional rights. Well, you know, the new, the new or should have known thing might need some further augmentation because, you know, the whole clearly established doctrine is like, if it were just new or should have known, I wouldn't be quite so uptight, but like clearly established is a whole other level, right? So like you should know that this is wrong is not as much a problem, but like, you know, the whole clearly established, I don't know. The subjective element of good faith frequently has proved incompatible with our admi admonition in prior cases. The insubstantial cases should not pr proceed to trial. Federal rules of civil procedure provides disputed question of fact may not be decided on summary judgment. That's very true. Official subjective good faith has been considered to be a question of fact. Some have been regarded as inherently requiring resolution by a jury. So they're saying, like, this looks like a fact question. It feels like a fact question, but we're probably going to tell you why it's not now. In the context of the attempted balancing of competing values, it's now clear that substantial costs attend the litigation of subjectively good faith of the government officials. Not only are there genuine costs of subjecting officials to risk of trial, distraction of officials from governmental duties, inhibition of discretionary action, deterrence of people from service, there are special costs to the subject of inquiry. Immunity generally is available only to officials performing discretionary functions. Okay. In contrast with the thought process accompanying ministerial tasks, which are automatic and not like subject to discretion, right? Judgment surrounding discretionary action almost inevitably influence where decision makers experience values and emotions. These variables explain in part why questions of subjective intent rarely can decide by summary judgment, yet they also frame a background which is often no clear end to relevant evidence. Judicial inquiry into subjective motivation, therefore, may be entitled to a broad-ranging discovery and deposing of numerous persons, including officials, professional colleagues. Inquiries of these kind can be peculiarly disruptive of the effect of government. You know, there is a point to be made here, right? There is a point to be made here. Like, if we're trying to peek too much behind the curtain, you know, and people are going to be guiding everything they know by the fear they can be sued, they won't be able to give as good advice, they won't be able to do their job as well, people won't do it. Like, there's a point to be had here, right? If, if they were always second-guessing themselves, they couldn't necessarily do the job, which we need them to do. So we don't necessarily want them to always second-guess themselves. So, like, there is a point to be had here, right? This is, like, why I'm not quite ready to throw in the towel on qualified immunity. But there is something here. You know, we don't want every official looking at every act, you know, this carefully. We don't want them, like, inhibited from their job, you know, because every minute they're spending doing this kind of, like, second-guessing analysis is the minute they're not making a decision, right? So there's some real costs here. And same thing for the police official, right? There's some real costs here. So we need them to be able to do their job, but we're concerned about the other thing. So like, there is a balance here. So that's why I'm not quite ready to throw qualified immunity over the, over the riverbank yet, right? It's like there is something here where they're trying to satisfy. It's just that for me, the balance has swung too far one way, and we need to figure out a way to pull it back. You know, ending the doctrine completely is a very extreme remedy. It's not necessarily the wrong remedy, but I, ideally, I'd like to find an alternative solution. Ideally, I'd like to find a way to pull this back to be a little less coverage because the balance has, at least as been expressed, is in the wrong place. But the idea they're going for, I think, is fundamentally right, right? It's like, we want people to give good advice to the president. We want them to be candid. We want them to be free. We want them to be able to express their opinion. We want the police officer to be able to go forth and execute the laws. We want them to be able to act in a way that's going to protect everybody, right? So there's there's something here that makes sense to my mind that we're trying to compass. But the the balance is wrong right now. So if I can figure out a way, if I could figure out a way to to scale it back, which might be an issue of like minute by minute judgment. Maybe it's an issue of just like in each individual case moving the line a little bit, moving the line a little bit and letting it being done in a very sort of slow way rather than like a a cl clear decision that resets the balance. But either way, I think it's in the wrong place, but I don't think we should kill the doctrine altogether if we can avoid it. Because there is something here that is of value to my mind, that we want police officers to police, we want executive branch officials to execute, 
execute execute so there's something here that's important and it's it's worth something in terms of making sure that they're not being completely battered down by every little frivolous thing right or even like every sort of um not necessarily frivolous but every sort of tangential every sort of discretionary thing there's there's a line here that we're trying to protect that makes sense Consistent with the balance we aimed at in our prior case, we conclude that bare allegations of malice should not subject government officials to either the cost of trial or the burdens of broad reaching discovery. Yeah, you know, these are real things. Like, you know, discovery is a pain in the ass. It is a it is a pain in the ass. It's a real problem. So yeah. We therefore hold government officials performing disc discretionary functions are shielded from liability for civil damages insofar as their conduct does not violate clearly established rights of which a reasonable person would have known. See, yeah, this is this is for me like what we need to like tweak. This part right here is insofar as their conduct does not violate clearly established rights. This is what we need to like figure out a different way of phrasing this. We need something else other than clearly established. That's the problem that's holding us back. We need something more. We need to figure out a way to tweak this language. This language is not working for us anymore. But like all I'm all, all all I'm trying to do, really, if I were a judge, all I'm trying to do is rewrite the back half of this sentence. Right. A after the word as insofar. That's where I'm trying to, like, fix the rest of the sentence. But the general ideas we're trying to express are right. The general philosophy is right. I'm trying to fix the back half of the sentence. So, yeah, that's that's where my mind is. Reliance on objective reasonableness of conduct is merited by reference to clearly established law should avoid disruption of government and permit resolution of insubstantial claims. Yes, it did that. It did that, but unfortunately it swept too far. Which, you know, you can't necessarily blame the Supreme Court, you know, because they're not God. You know, they were trying to strike a balance. They came up with a standard and we've moved forward and we've had problems with it, right? So now we need to figure out a way to push it back. We need the standard to go backwards. So, like, was this a reasonable point to put it out? Yeah, it's not even necessarily wrong as phrased. It's wrong as it's been applied. As we've actually tried to go execute it, it's not really worked out. And then if you go look at what O'Connor said in Casey versus Planned Parenthood as reasons you should reopen decisions, this is one of them, right? It's proved unworkable is basically one of the four factors that O'Connor said. Right? It's proved unworkable. We, we had it. We applied it. It's proved unworkable. So it's time to reopen. Time to give us another shot. Try again. So, you know, for me, it's like, you know, it wasn't necessarily wrong as phrased, but as we've applied it, as we've applied it, as we've applied it, it's been a real problem. So it's time to give it another go. You know, fair enough. On summary judgment, the judge appropriately may determine not only the currently applicable law, but whether the law was clearly established. If at the time it was not clearly established, official could not reasonably know to expect the legal developments, nor could it be fairly say to know the law forbade it. Until the threshold questions were resolved, discovery should not be re allowed. And, like, I don't know that the Supreme Court could or should even be expected to foresee where this would go, right? This is 1970s. Let's give them a break, guys, all right? You know, they're not God. They're doing their best, right? So they, they put out the standards. Like, if you read it on its face, it seems perfectly reasonable. And then looking back at it 50 years later, it's like, oh, wait a second. We had a problem. But, like, you know, they're not God. They came up with a standard. They thought it was workable and we've been applying it. It's a problem. It's time to figure out a different standard. You know, let's, let's revise the case law. It's fine by me, you know, but there is something here that's valuable. So it's just an issue of, can we figure out a way to restate this? And, you know, I'm not even necessarily saying that I'd be able to restate it correctly. You know, I'm not saying that you put, give me the power to be able to restate this. I come up with something that's going to be workable and put it in the right place. But I'm going to try. And if it doesn't work, we'll try again. Try, try, try again. You know, We'll, we'll keep doing it till we get it right. You know, what else can we do? If I keep trying until we get it right, we put the balance too far one way, let's move it back. If we move it back too far, we'll figure out something else. You know, let's just keep doing it till we get it right. We'll do our best. We're human beings. Give us a break here. If the law is clearly established, the immunity defense ordinarily should fail. So a reasonably competent official should know the law. Nevertheless, if official pleading can demonstrate extraordinary circumstances and prove that he neither knew or should have known, the defense should be sustained. I turn primarily on objective factors, which shows this extreme element, right? Yeah, Ewan, Ewan Marshall says, uh, start with holding to a reasonable purpose, not a person, not a reasonable officer. Well, Ewan, at least traditionally in law, there's no real, there's no real separation between those. Like the reason we, we've come out with these fictional reasonable people, but they're always like the reasonable person in the end. So at the moment, there's no distinguishment between the reasonable officer and reasonable person. 
or at least to my mind, there's not. I mean, I, I suppose there's could be lawyers who would disagree with me. Maybe they would. But like, you know, we've seen the reasonable, we've seen the reasonable officer, we've seen the reasonable hairdresser, we've seen the reasonable everything, right? But to me, it's all a reasonable person. To me, it's all just like one big universe. So to me, it's there's not a separation. So I, I don't know that there is a current distinguishment in law, really, in the end, between the reasonable person and the reasonable officer. But maybe there should be. And maybe the reasonable person should be something a little bit different. Yeah, possible. By defining the limits of qualified immunity essentially in objective terms, we provide no less license to lawless conduct. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that one, Supreme Court. You kind of did a little bit. The public interest in deterrence of unlawful conduct and the incompensation of victims remains protected by a test that focuses on objective legal reasonableness. Where an official could be expected to know certain conduct would violate the rights, he should be made to hesitate. Fair enough. Where a person who suffers injury should have a cause of action. But where an official duties legitimately require action which established rights are not implicated, the public interest may be served with impudence and without fear of consequence. Yeah, I just it kind of gone too far. In this case, petitioners have asked us to hold the respondents' pretrial showings were insufficient to survive. We think it appropriate, however, to remand the case to the district court for reconsideration. Trial court is more familiar, and the judgment is vacated. All right, so that's pretty much the end of the opinion, and then we get some concurring and other opinions. But yeah, that's basically the end of this opinion. So, you know, you, at least for me, where I sit on this is I understand the rationale the court is trying to do. I understand what they're trying to do, and I try and understand why. It's like, and you know, there there is a real problem that we're trying to solve at the end of it. Like the ultimate, the ultimate end problem that for me, like the ultimate end problem that we're trying to solve is there's a police officer and there's a person and there's been a police chase, right? Maybe a foot chase and it's ended in an alley and the person, you know, seems to be reaching something and seems to have something out in their hand, right? And the officer has to make a decision, right? That's the ultimate problem we're trying to solve, at least in my mind, right? And it's like, how, how can we not give the police officer some sort of latitude in this issue? Because maybe there was nothing in the hand at all. Maybe it just, maybe it came up and they just thought there was something there, but there wasn't anything at all. At all. Or maybe it wasn't a firearm or anything dangerous. Or maybe there wasn't, you know, it could have been, it could have been a lot of things. Or maybe it really was something dangerous, you know? It's like we don't have time to we don't have time to figure that out, and we certainly don't have the luxury of looking backwards in time and figuring it out. You know, so like the ultimate problem we're trying to solve is we're trying to give the officer that split second life or death discretion, where there's no time to think, there's no time to analyze, and we have to figure out what to do, right? And like the ability to use force in that situation seems reasonable, even if after the fact it turns out there was no problem, right? And that's the most extreme example to my mind, but obviously there are lesser examples. In the context of the president, we want people to give him good advice. We want people to give him free advice. We want people to be free in what they say. We want people to be able to execute without constant fear of litigation, constant fear of stuff, especially as it applies to them personally, right? You know, you can, we can sue the government all day long, you know, for all kinds of stuff, but to sue the person behind it, you know, who would take a job if they're responsible, right? So there, there is a problem we're trying to solve here. There's a real problem we're trying to solve where people who are executing things are sometimes doing so in unclear situations, in gray areas and all the rest of it. So there's a real problem. But as we've covered on this channel way too many times, like, I think it's gone too far. It's gone too far. There's too many situations where it seems completely outrageous and the Court of Appeals is saying, but there's no clearly established law. And I'm like, really? Really? It's like, how, how can we not know this, right? Now, we've certainly seen some decisions that go the other way where it says, like, this isn't one of those gray areas, but we've seen too many that are. And so for me, I understand the problem they're trying to solve. I understand why I'm trying to solve it. But for me, it's like, I, you know, I think we need to reset the balance. So I don't necessarily blame the, blame the Supreme Court. 1982 opinion, so it's a 40-year-old opinion. In 40 years, the way they've applied it just simply hasn't worked out as well. So it's time to re-examine it, reset the balance somewhere else. Not sure exactly where that should be. Not sure exactly how we should phrase it. Um, be something you don't want to spend a lot of time considering, hopefully to avoid the problems you were trying to fix in the first place and not go too far. But I understand it. And so that's a good summary of qualified immunity case. So that's the end of our discussion of that case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. I appreciate your continued support. 
If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel and you can also support us financially by clicking the applaud button below. Thank you so much for your contributions to our channel. It helps our work grow. Until later, cheers and goodbye.